You are listening to Veggie Doctor Radio, and this is episode number 262. Welcome to Veggie Doctor Radio. I am your host, Dr. Yami, board certified pediatrician, certified lifestyle medicine physician, certified health and wellness coach, author, speaker, mother, wife, and human being. I passionately believe in the power of diet, habits, and mindset in sparking and sustaining well-being and joy in our lives. This podcast combines expert interviews and thoughtful monologues to explore plant-based nutrition, lifestyle medicine, parenting, mindset, and other exciting and fun topics. I hope that these episodes inspire you, uplift you, and equip you with the knowledge and tools to live your best life. Are you ready to get started? Let's do it. Hey, veggie lover, welcome to another episode in the fasting series. Now this series is intended to provide education about the potential health and longevity benefits of different forms of fasting, including time-restricted eating, intermittent fasting, and extended water-only fasting. Please be aware that in this series, we will be discussing different forms of fasting and food restriction. And in some cases, there will be references to body size and weight. This material and these methods are not appropriate for children, pregnant people, or people with certain medical conditions. Please do not attempt these practices without medical supervision as it could be very dangerous. These concepts may also be triggering for people with disordered eating or eating disorders, so please practice discretion before listening to these episodes. Thank you and I hope that you enjoy this episode. Dr. Mark Mattson is the former chief of the Laboratory of Neurosciences at the National Institute on Aging and is now on the Faculty of Neuroscience at Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine. His research has advanced an understanding of the cellular signaling mechanisms that control the formation of plasticity of neural networks in the brain and cellular and molecular mechanisms of brain aging and neurodegenerative disorders. His research has also elucidated how the brain responds adaptively to challenges such as fasting and exercise, and he has used that information to develop novel interventions to promote optimal brain function throughout life. Dr. Mattson is among the most highly cited neuroscientists in the world, with more than 900 publications and 200,000 citations. He was elected a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science and has received many awards, including the Metropolitan Life Foundation Medical Research Award and the Alzheimer's Association Zenith Award. Mattson is the author of the book, The Intermittent Fasting Revolution, The Science of Optimizing Health and Enhancing Performance. In this episode of Veggie Doctor Radio, key takeaways are intermittent fasting is not a diet, it is an eating pattern. It takes at least 12 hours of fasting to trigger the metabolic switch that occurs after you deplete glycogen stores. Exercising during a fasted state enhances the use of fat and ketones, which is why we see an additive positive effect of exercise during fasting. Fasting provides benefits independent of calorie restriction. Human body evolved to function in a food deprived state. It takes two to four weeks to adapt to a new eating pattern. So be patient when you adopt time restricted eating. Fasting has positive cognitive effects and may decrease the risk of Alzheimer's disease. And fasting alone can lead to positive metabolic effects, including improved insulin sensitivity and cardiovascular benefits independent of weight loss. Enjoy the episode. Dr. Mark Matson, welcome to Veggie Doctor Radio. Well, it's great to be here. I look forward to talking with you about fasting. Well, it's such an honor to have you on the show because you are such an experienced researcher. You've been doing work in this area for a long time. So before we get started on some of the more intellectual topics, I would just love to know, how did you even become interested in this topic? And tell us how long have you been studying fasting, intermittent fasting? I became interested in it. It was kind of serendipitously. Um, Back in the mid-1990s, when I was a professor at University of Kentucky at the Center on Aging there, uh, 
We're doing a lot of work trying to understand what goes wrong in the brain in Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease, why neurons die in stroke. And it was known that daily calorie restriction or intermittent fasting every other day, food deprivation in rats or mice will have a really a profound impact on their lifespan longevity. So for example, with every other day fasting in some strains of rats and mice, if it's initiated when they're young, they'll live twice as long as will animals that are fed ad libitum. Uh, so we, we had these animal models, rat or mouse models that are relevant to Alzheimer's, Parkinson's and stroke. So we had, in the case of Alzheimer's, genetically engineered mice that express mutated genes that cause Alzheimer's in humans. In case of Parkinson's, we used a neurotoxin that selectively damages dopamine producing neurons. And then stroke, we just actually do a surgical, we occlude a blood vessel in the brain for say an hour and then allow reperfusion. So that mimics a clot forming in the blood vessel, which is what causes most strokes. And then oftentimes the clot will resolve. But anyway, in all of these animal models, the animals on the intermittent fasting eating uh, pattern ex exhibited less damage to neurons and improved functional outcomes. So less cognitive impairment in the Alzheimer's model, less motor dysfunction in the Parkinson's and stroke models. So that's, that's what got, so, you know, back at that time, I wasn't really thinking about it from the standpoint of general health or, you know, other, other age-related diseases. Okay. Well, let's back up and talk about what is intermittent fasting. And can you talk about what are the different types? Because it's kind of a broad category of different subtypes of ways that people can limit their food intake. Yeah, so uh, the first thing to say is intermittent fasting is not a diet, it's an eating pattern. So a diet is what you eat and how much. Intermittent fasting is independent that independent of that. So it's an eating pattern that involves uh, regular, usually regular periods of going without any calorie intake for at least 12 to 14 hours. And the reason for that time window is we kind of define it experimentally as a, it takes that long to get a metabolic switch in which you've depleted your liver glycogen stores, which is essentially glucose. That's the first energy source that your body and brain, all your cells use if you're in the fed state. So that's depleted in about 10, 12 hours or so. And then what happens is fats are released from fat cells and they're converted in the liver to what are called ketones. There's two main ketones that can be used for energy by cells. One's called beta-hydroxybutyrate or BHB. The other one's called acetoacetate. But anyway, so to be considered an intermittent fasting eating pattern, it has to have uh, frequent periods with at least 12 to 14 hours with no food intake. Um, the most common, in, from a practical standpoint in humans, probably the most common approach is what's called daily time-restricted eating, where you constrict the time window each day that you eat. So, for example, I myself, I don't eat breakfast. And then usually I exercise in the late morning, say 11.30 or something, and it's about an hour by the time I get done. And then then I eat. So I don't eat before noon usually, hardly ever. And I try not to eat after 6 p.m. So I'm going 18 hours every day uh, you know, without taking any calorie intake. And so this metabolic switch is probably 
And then I'm, I said I'm exercising at the end of that period. So that actually that enhances the the use of fat and the ketones because you're running on the ketones. So when I start exercising, I'm already using ketones. Mm -hmm. I've already depleted my liver uh, glycogen stores. And we can get into this, but it turns out that um, at least in animal studies where we've we've done this and published papers on this, when we combine intermittent fasting with exercise, you get kind of an additive effect in, in terms of a lot of the what we think are beneficial cellular changes that may help protect against disease. So one, one intermittent fasting eating pattern is time-restricted eating. A second, which, which came out of studies that were done by Michelle Harvey in England with the help of my laboratory in around 2009, 2010. So Michelle works with women at risk for breast cancer because of their family history and their overweight. And um, so she she actually saw our animal studies. We we'd done some things that had some implications actually for cancer, and so she came and talked to me at my lab and said, "Well, I'd like to do a study in in these women." And she said, "I don't think they can do what you've been doing in the rats and mice. You know, complete fasting." every other day, so 24 hours of no food, 20 hours. So what we decided on is two days a week, have, having the, the subjects eat only about 600 calories each of those days. And we had them do it two consecutive days. And th this is now called 5-2 intermittent fasting, but when we did the study, we didn't call it that in the published paper. We called it um, intermittent energy restriction. And the important thing about that study, the, 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 well, that was in humans. Another thing was we had 50 women in on the 5-2 intermittent fasting. And then the control group was women that they didn't eat as they normally did. We actually had them eat breakfast, lunch, and dinner, but they ate 20 to 25% fewer calories than they normally eat. So they're spacing their meals out, right? So they're they're not going you know, 12, 14 hours without food. And anyway, so over a six month period, both groups of women lost weight and they lost the same amount of body weight. And the reason is, is because their weekly calorie intakes were the same. And this is important because we found that in one of the measures, well, actually, yeah, mainly one of the measures, insulin sensitivity, the women on 5-2 intermittent fasting had a significantly greater improvement in insulin sensitivity, which means it's a, a greater anti-diabetic effect. Mm -hmm. Okay, then, um, so what led to the, in, in a lot of respects, what led to the popularization of intermittent fasting, kind of an explosion on the internet, was that a producer at the BBC, so, uh, Michelle Harvey, who did the study in these women at risk for breast cancer, she's in England. So this MD producer at the BBC, Michael Mosley, he saw the published paper, and so he did a documentary for the BBC. I think it's called Eat Fast, Live Longer, or something like that. And that aired in 2013. And then he wrote a book with a dietitian. It was kind of, it didn't really go into much of the science, and it had a bunch of menus and stuff. But And then... So this 5-2 intermittent fasting got kind of popular in, in the UK. And then there was a lot of buzz on the internet. And then uh, and then the daily time restricted eating, uh, Sachin Panda at the Salk Institute, doing a lot of work in animals. And there was kind of seeing similar things that we'd seen. And he was looking at some other endpoints. And so anyway, this kind of led to explosion on the internet, I think, in, in large part, and a lot of interest by the, the general public. Yeah, that's super so, so interesting. Um, now, I was just going to point out real quick, just so that the listeners are clear, that it was important to have that control group that had 
calorie restriction in order to see if, is it just overall that you're restricting calories? Is that yeah. what's leading to all of the effects or is there something different about doing this uh, time restriction where you're not, you're not putting food into your system? So I think that's important because I have seen people say, well, it's just calorie restriction. It's just overall calorie restriction that's causing all the benefits, but there seems to be something in addition to the calorie restriction. Am I right to say that? Yes. And we'd, we'd provided evidence for that in animal studies bef before the human study. We had a paper in the proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences in 2003, where we found that a certain strain of mouse, when we put them on every other day fasting, on the days they do have food, they eat twice, pretty much twice as much food as they normally eat. So they're not actually calorie restricted in the long run. And we still, we saw a lot of beneficial effects on, on the brain and even on glucose regulation. You know, so we had some evidence from animal studies. And we can talk about, you know, kind of the, my thinking and others, current thinking scientists on, on, you know, not only the overlap between the effects of calorie restriction, intermittent fasting, but maybe some of the uh, potential differences in mechanisms. Yeah, I would love to go into that. Like, how how is it working? Why is it causing some of these health benefits? And then maybe after you explain that to us, then we can talk about what are all the general and brain and cognitive benefits that we're seeing with fasting. Yeah. Oh, you want me to go ahead and start talking? Go for talking? it. Okay. <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right. Um, so the way I look at this is, one way to look at it is from an evolutionary perspective. Uh, and probably the easiest for people to kind of visualize in their minds is predators, like, say, wolves. So wolves in the wild, um, particularly in the winter months, they may go a week, maybe even more, without killing prey animal. So that is a week without eating anything. And that's that's their normal. They evolved that way. Now, in that state, when they haven't eaten food for a week, their brains and their bodies have to be functioning well. Other than that, they're not going to be able to expend the cognitive, the mental, or the physical effort to track down and then chase and kill a prey. And we've even proposed and published on this that a major driving force for brain evolution, including human brain evolution, was food scarcity. Mm -hmm. uh, humans, you know, we know, for, at least from the archaeological record, that all of the early tools invented by humans were tools whose functions had to do with acquiring food or processing food, you know, so whatever, spears or bows and arrows or, um, you know, stones for grinding and that kind of thing. Uh, and, and even fire was one of its early uses, I think, was probably for food cooking. Um, Okay, so anyway, the point is that body and the brain, our bodies and brains evolved to function well in a food deprived state. Okay, so what it is, is it about those conditions? Well, expending exercise, expending mental effort using your brain, it's a stress on your muscle cells. It's a stress on your brain cells when you use them. In fact, so I'm a neuroscientist, so I know a lot about neural excitability. So muscle cells are excitable cells. When they're active, there's um, flux of sodium into the cells, depolarization of the membrane, calcium influx. There's increased free radical production. So when you're exercising, and right now, Dr. Yami and you and I, in our brain cells, there's calcium influx, there's increased free radical production in the nerve cells that are involved in thinking about this conversation. But it's okay, because actually that 
mild stress engages adaptive cellular stress response pathways in cells. And that involves genes such as genes that encode antioxidant enzymes, genes that um, that enhance the ability of the cells to remove garbage, molecular garbage. Uh, we showed in one study uh, genes that are involved in repair of damage to DNA. And the important thing here is if we don't expose our cells, and again, I'm focusing on muscle and brain cells, if we don't expose our cells to mild stress, whether it's from kind of an acute stress of exercise or mental exercise or a more subtle stress of food deprivation, the cells become complacent and these pathways, these gene pathways, antioxidant pathways, DNA repair pathways, autophagy pathways, they're downregulated. Mm. So essentially, kind of in layman terms, if we don't subject ourselves to these kinds of mild, evolutionarily normal challenges, I, I like to use the word challenge rather than stress often because people always think that stress is a bad thing. But from if you think about it, like if I pretend I'm a nerve cell, right? Right now I'm perceiving a lot of stress in those neurons in my hippocampus that are focused on our conversation. Um, again, the free radical production and so on. So anyway, and uh, so, but the other thing that's important is there has to be a recovery period for optimal long-term health. So with exercise, right, you know, people exercise daily or three times a week, but it's important to have a recovery period. And with intermittent fasting, by definition, there's a recovery period, and that's the period when you eat, right? So when you're in the, the challenge mode, metabolic challenge mode of uh, fasting, the fasted state, um, the cells go into a conserve resources, enhance defense system mode, you know, recycle things and so on, autophagy. But then in the recovery mode, they go into a growth and plasticity mode. And we've shown this in the neurons in the brains of mice where um, this intermittent fasting will actually increase the number of mitochondria the energy producing organelles in the neurons. So, and we think exercise does that too. It's, it's, that's been well shown in muscle cells. We think it's occurring in nerve cells too. But that requires these cycles of challenge recovery, challenge recovery. And this is something we've emphasized a lot. Uh, you know, that the challenge period sets in motion the gene expression patterns that then enable, you know, increased strength, say muscle cells, function, you know, number of synapses and neurons, those kinds of things. So that's kind of our, our general thinking. There's a lot more deals, details I could go into, but I think most of your listeners and viewers may not be scientists, so I don't want to get too far into the weeds on specific genes or proteins or things like that. Yeah, no, I think that was a great description. Basically, you're saying is we need to trigger these old pathways by challenging our system and we challenge our system during the time that we're restricting our eating. That time allows the cells to clean up, to throw out the trash, take out the garbage. But then the recovery period is when we're feeding. So when we're done with our fasting, we're eating, and then we are rebuilding new things and better things. We cleaned up the trash, now we're rebuilding. So we, like you're saying, need that challenge and then the recovery period. And this isn't happening when we're constantly eating. So I know that compared to you know, 50, 70 years ago, we used to eat about three meals a day. Now we eat on average seven times per day. 
So most people aren't giving any time. Like most people probably aren't even feeling hungry because I know I used to be like that. Like I, I think I went decades without even ever experiencing hunger. I was just eating all the time habitually. So when we're doing that, we're not allowing these old pathways to be triggered and to clean up all of that trash, to take out the garbage. There's a double whammy that's occurred in the last, say, 40 years or so. Uh, you know, one is the fructose, high fructose corn syrup, uh, fast food industry. And, but the second is advances in technology so that people don't have to get, you know, physical exercise to do their jobs. So as you met, as you pointed out, say in the 1940s, 50s, and so on, more people are doing physical labor and they're getting exercise. So they're getting more exercise on the one hand and they're not eating so much, you know, high calorie density junk food. Um, yeah, so, yeah. yeah. And then the other thing is, there's this very interesting thing and I, I put, yeah, I, I, I mentioned in this in a section in my book, there's something called epigenetics. So people know about inheritance, right? You know, I, my mom had brown eyes. I inherited brown eyes from her, et cetera. Um, you know, certain traits. Uh, and that's through differences in the sequence of DNA. But there's also in the DNA, the genes that encode proteins. But there's also this process called epigenetics where the the environmental exposures, the conditions under which an individual lives during their early life, you know, in their pre-reproductive and reproductive years, can influence their offspring, their kids. So essentially in this epigenetic type of non-classical inheritance, what a, a parent does, so the, the good example is obesity. And this started in animals, and there's good evidence this happens in humans too. So if we take um, take a female mouse or rat, and we give it high fructose corn syrup in its drinking water, and high saturated fat in the, its solid food, it will become obese, and actually even diabetic as it gets older. If we then get that female pregnant, you know, made it with a male. Well, you know, it's obese. So it gets pregnant. Then its offspring, even when we put them, actually, this is, I say we, but I mean, it's just, I, this is not my lab. That's si other scientists who did this. Uh, multiple labs have done this. When they put that, those baby mice, after they're weaned, put them on a, a healthy diet, the, the normal diet that the rats would eat, they still become obese or tend to not maybe as obese as on the, the high fructose. But the point is, and, and so I think this is very important for prospective parents. I, that's one thing I'm most concerned about educating prospective parents that, and it seems like it's mostly the female there. There's good evidence in humans that, if a woman has obesity or type two diabetes during her pregnancy, her child's gonna have poor out health outcomes in a number of ways and even be at increased risk for autism. And evidence is pretty strong. So as you probably know, long time ago, it used to be the advice for pregnant women was take it easy, don't overdo it, you want to, you know, get enough energy in your diet because your baby needs energy to, you know, grow in the womb. Okay, so that's that's that. But then we talked about evolution. You know, so humans didn't evolve with pregnant women uh, being obese. Humans evolved with pregnant women working, foraging, carrying their you know, 
infant baby on their front or back while they're working, you know, while they're pregnant again, you know, not being overweight. Hunter-gatherers just aren't overweight. It doesn't happen. So, you know, this advice that take it easy, you know, don't exercise too much, get plenty of energy intake. Uh, it depends on the, you know, if a woman's skinny, then, you know, she needs to get enough energy, right? But if a woman is overweight, um, I don't think she should, you know, eat more than she already is. Uh, the other thing with, the, you know, uh, fat accumulation, it when it's long term, fat, white fat, the kind of fat that accumulates in your belly, the kind of it is, it's an, those cells produce like inflammatory mediators that can kind of cause a general inflammation type thing. And you don't, you don't want to have that for yourself, but you certainly don't want to have a inflammatory environment for your baby developing in, in the uterus. Yeah. Um, and that's definitely something that I talk about as well. During pregnancy is a great time to focus on eating lots of whole plant foods, uh, not just because it benefits your health, but because babies can actually taste in the womb and it, you're passing down some of those advantages to your baby. But you know, you're talking about those epigenetic changes. There are studies that show that what a mom eats during her pregnancy may actually affect not just her child, but her grandchild if she's carrying yeah, a daughter right. because it's affecting the eggs that are being produced yeah. in her baby while she's pregnant. So that's two generations down, not to shame or guilt any pregnant moms. It's a hard time for a lot of mamas and parents, but right. it's just an, a, a reason to just be mindful, eat more plants and try to avoid at the very least all of these ultra processed foods because we know that metabolically when we're consuming these ultra processed foods, high in saturated fat, high in sugar, refined foods, they are potentially affecting the future health of your baby. Even if your baby is born perfectly healthy, it's changing some of the pathways in their bodies and, you know, I wonder if some of it is because the baby is experiencing stress from that food. So the body saying, okay, we need to be prepared for whatever stressful environment we're about to be born into. So we need to set up these mechanisms, these safeguards because of this. So I think that those are all great points. Let's talk about now, um, let's go through what are the general health benefits of intermittent fasting and more specifically the brain and cognitive effects of intermittent fasting. Well, general health benefits. Well, the first thing is, you know, I talked about daily time restricted eating, 5 2 intermittent fasting. One key thing is that people need to recognize that it takes a while, several weeks to a month, for them to adapt to the new eating pattern. So I mentioned I don't eat breakfast. I've had, you know, I can't count how many people have approached me and said, well, I tried, you know, not eating breakfast. I can't do it. Um, get hungry, irritable. I can't concentrate. And I'd say, you know, how many days did you do it? And they said, I just did it once, one day. <laughs> and th th it turns out it, it takes at least two weeks and up to a month to adapt so that you no longer hungry, irritable during the time period that you'd previously been eating. And we even think we know what's going on in the brain to explain that. Um, and it's pretty interesting. So I, I'll start with that and then go to some other th cognition and some other thing. Uh, yeah, so we'd seen this in a number of studies. Uh, I mentioned these first studies we did where we put animals on every other day fasting or not, and then in the models of Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, stroke, we found that we had to have them maintained on the intermittent fasting for several weeks to a month before we saw a beneficial effect. Mm. And then we started following this up, looking at the mechanisms, doing biochemical analysis of the brains of the animals, 
gene expression and so on. And what we found is pretty interesting. So I have to give a little uh, neuroscience 101 here. Uh, I'll ask you this, Dr. Yami. I don't oh, no. want to embarrass you now. So <laughs> don't be embarrassed. What, what is the brain's most important neurotransmitter? Oh, gosh. I don't know. I don't want to say the wrong thing. <laughs> uh, okay. Most pe people have probably heard of dopamine, right? Mm -hmm. That's not it. Serotonin? No. It's glutamate. Yeah, I would have gotten that wrong. <laughs> yeah, gl gl glutamate's an amino acid. More than 90% of the nerve cells in our brain deploy glutamate as their neurotransmitter. Uh, the second most prominent neurotransmitter is called GABA. It's an inhibitory neurotransmitter, kind of quiets. So glutamate's the excitatory transmitter. Without glutamate, your brain goes blank. Hmm. Without GABA, you have epileptic seizures because... Of GABA inhibits the activity. And then dopamine, serotonin, acetylcholine, the only way they affect our behaviors, our mood or cognition or any behavior is by modifying the ongoing activity in the what we call glutamate turgic circuits. So we simply, we, we did studies where we recorded, um, put an electrode in a glutamate using neuron in the hippocampus, which is a brain region critical for learning and memory. It's a brain region where neurons degenerate in Alzheimer's disease. So we had animals on every other day, intermittent fasting or not, you know, the, the, the control group. And we let them go for one week, two weeks, a month. Then we recorded, uh, actually what we recorded is the release of the inhibitory neurotransmitter GABA onto the glutamatergic neurons. And the bottom line is we found the intermittent fasting by two weeks and, and much more clearly by a month, there was increased GABA tone, kind of increased quieting of the uh, neural circuits. And um, <clears throat> this is interesting because we'd, pre we'd and in the same study, we published this study in a journal called Nature Communications. And in the same study, we did behavioral measures of anxiety levels in the mice. And the animals that were adapted to intermittent fasting had reduced anxiety levels. We also found that if we just do one day of fasting in an animal that's never fasted before, its anxiety levels go way up. So this is what humans experience here if you normally eat breakfast and you skip it. Okay, then what about cognition? So we'd found in our animal models of Alzheimer's disease that uh, the intermittent fasting would, would uh, actually prevent or greatly delay the onset of cognitive decline in the mouse that get amyloid and and have neural degeneration in their brain. And then uh, we did some more looking at the mechanisms there. And the bottom line is there's increasing in, increase in the number of synapses in these hippocampal neurons I'm talking about. This occurs over a period of a few weeks. And there's also, I mentioned, increased number of mitochondria in the neurons. And then when we measure the strength of connectivity between the glutamatergic neurons, it's increased. So this is all consistent with an increased number of synapses, a strengthening of synapses. Now in humans, there's very little known. There's, there's really no good, well, there's a couple of published studies. They're not ideal in humans looking at caloric restriction and cognition, one in uh, intermittent fasting, and showing some some benefits. We, uh, we have a study that 
we're getting all the data together now. It's with 5-2 intermittent fasting in people at risk for cognitive impairment and Alzheimer's because of their age and metabolic status. They're 55 to 70 years old with insulin resistance and obesity. And we're, we're actually done. All the subjects are through this study. It would have been done a long time ago, but COVID hit and we had to stop it for essentially two years. Uh, and But anyway, the, the people in, in the group are getting the data together now. You know, so the, the hypothesis, uh, we do know their body weights and we know they they lost body weight in 5-2 intermittent fasting. Actually, it was interesting that the control group lost a little body weight and it was significant. And I think it was because they're in the study and the control group, we gave them advice for healthy eating and, you know, gave them a flyer on it that they took home. Uh, so they lost some weight too, but not as much as the 5 to intermittent fasting. So in that study, we're doing did a battery of cognitive tests. We did functional magnetic resonance imaging of their brain to look at neural network activity. We did what's called structural MRI. We can measure the size of their hippocampus, for example. And then we're doing a lot of blood work. We even took, did a spinal tap, did, so we have cerebrospinal fluid. So we can look at some of the neurochemicals in the fluid that braze, braze the brain cells. We're going to look at some of the name neuro, same neurochemicals that we found were changed in the brains of the animals with intermittent fasting. Um, now, of course, you know, listeners and viewers will know there's a lot of historical, it's anecdotal, but it's still, it's quite an extensive anecdotal evidence that fasting is good for the brain, you know, from religious standpoint, you know, uh, get, you know, spiritual standpoint, but also um, a lot of famous people have commented in the writings that um, they did fasting and found that they did their best thinking when they were fasting. I find that personally, so I skip breakfast and my brain works the best in the morning hours. There's no doubt about it. So I retired from the NIH three years ago and I've written a couple of books, the one on intermittent fasting, but I have another one coming out on glutamate. It's called Sculptor and Destroyer, Tales of Glutamate, the Brain's Most Important Neurotransmitter. Cool. And then I started a podcast. So I do all that in the morning. And then I'm not completely goofing off, but, you know, kind of enjoying myself the rest of the day. Uh, well, you're yeah, entitled so to it because you're retired now. So definitely enjoy your time. <laughs> yeah. But let me point something out real quick. I just want to make sure the listeners didn't miss this. As you were talking about the group that was recruited, you mentioned that these were people that were at risk for cognitive impairment because they have metabolic syndrome. So a lot of people don't realize that the brain and your thinking is related and you know connected to the rest of your body and i think for a long time we've been told and we've believed that if you get dementia it's just something you're going to get you've got bad genes you know your grandparents great grandparents had dementia you're just going to get dementia there's nothing you can do about it so i think it's important for listeners to understand that we do see associations we do see risk factors and we know that your brain is actually connected to the rest of your body <laughs> it's got the same blood going through it and it needs a lot of energy so we want to take good care care of it so we we can see that there's these things that we can do in our lives these choices habits and behaviors that can actually decrease our risk of developing cognitive impairment so i think that's the first point i wanted to make um i also want to say anecdotally because i have been practicing time restricted eating myself for the past three months and I can definitely attest to that feeling you know, you're talking about the neurotransmitters and what they do you feel calm but focused. But I will say that it, when it's close to my feeding time, because I generally eat around the same time every day, I start to feel increased urgency, which 
is probably a correct thing, right? Because your body's like, all right, let's go find food. <laughs> so I'm calm and focused until it gets close to when I need to eat. And then my brain's like, and feed me now. So, so yeah, it's what, a very what, interesting phenomenon. What, when do you exercise, Dr. Yami? So I exercise in the morning early, generally, most of the time. Yeah. So I exercise yeah. us, usually around 6 a.m. And yeah. then I eat midday. So I'm an OMAD. Yeah. I'm on an OMAD schedule right now, and my my meal is midday, so. Wow, I can't. It's hard for me to get enough calories. I have a I have a low body weight, you know, quite low. My BMI is 18. Wow. And so it's important I, you know, so I can't. In one meal, I can't get enough calories. And I eat a diet that has a lot of vegetables. I do eat some whole grains, but they're you know like oat oatmeal and that kind of thing. Fish, no red meat, um, you know, nuts. Uh, yeah, so I, I essentially eat two meals and then they're... Yeah, I, I definitely don't have the low body weight issue and I am, my body is built for ultimate survival. So I can eat massive quantities of food even in the period of 30 to 60 minutes. So it's wow. not a problem for me and actually it works perfect. It feels perfect and it's freed up a lot of my life. So, that's so that's good. very interesting. Okay. So since I'm, we talked, I want to, be, be, before we forget it, I would, this point on, you know, insulin resistance in the brain, yeah. there is good evidence that people with long standing type two diabetes are at increased risk for age related cognitive impairment and Alzheimer's disease. There's also evidence that the nerve cells in the brain, can themselves become insulin resistant. Wow. So neurons can use either glucose or ketones as their energy source. And in patients with mild cognitive impairment, which is often a precursor to Alzheimer's disease, studies have shown that the ability of the nerve cells to take up glucose is impaired. That's in humans. That's something called PET imaging with radio labeled glucose. And however, we, we think they may still be able to use ketones. So there's a number of clinical trials going on now with um, what are called ketone esters in people with mild cognitive impairment. I should also point out children and adolescents with obesity and insulin resistance, there's evidence that on average, a child with obesity, at least some regions of their brain are smaller than their their peers, their classmates, without obesity. And there's multiple studies on this. It's not just one or two. So um, the good news is we think, uh, and this is based mainly on animal studies, but uh, we think that, can, that, you know, say lower size of the hippocampus can be increased with exercise and fasting, mm -hmm. you know, so that, as you pointed out, this is really important for the brain, even in children and adolescents, that obesity, type two diabetes is not good for their brain, both when they're at that age and in the long run. Yeah, and you had been talking about the animal models and the animal studies earlier, I know that I did read in your book that the animals that were started on the fasting earlier had even better benefits. So the earlier we can start to implement some of these habits, not constant grazing all day, yeah. having at least minimum of 12 hour fasting between dinner and breakfast, eating our vegetables and our fruits, the better. But as you're saying, it's never too late. So for parents not to despair that, you know, we can slowly start to change those habits for the better. I wanted to touch a little bit on the role of inflammation and specifically how it affects aging and disease and how does fasting affect inflammation? Uh, this has lo been looked at mostly outside the brain. Um, we looked a little bit there, they're just kind of simple studies and they were mostly in models of Alzheimer's disease where there's already inflammation. So 
studies of looking at, uh, say, liver, muscle, uh, have shown that obesity increases inflammation in those tissues. And that's by measuring what are called pro-inflammatory cytokines uh, in the blood, actually. Systemically, there's a systemic increase in these pro-inflammatory cytokines. So when there's inflammation, whether it's from a physical injury uh, or arthritis, you know, it doesn't matter. There's in that local environment, there's immune cells called macrophages that produce these pro-inflammatory cytokines. One's called TNF or tumor necrosis factor. In fact, uh, uh, drugs, kind of the main drugs used now for rheumatoid arthritis, Crohn's disease, some other inflammatory conditions are antibodies that are infused into the bloodstream antibodies against TNF. There may be a, be a listener or viewers that you know are taking these drugs. I actually don't know their the company name of them. I just know you know that they're TNF antibodies, and they have the end of them. It's MAB something MAB, mm-hmm. right? When and so anyway, so they bind to the TNF and prevent it from you know kind of ex- causing a this amplifying inflammatory cycle. So fasting will suppress inflammation. It will kind of quiet down these macrophages, these activated macrophages, make them less active. They produce less TNF. We actually did an asthma study. It was our first human study we published. It's got a little bit buried in the literature. Uh, A lot of people, the the researchers know about it, but the public may not. So this was a study. uh, There was a MD down in Louisiana, Louisiana State University Hospital. And he works with asthma patients. And he came to me, saw our animal studies. He said, I'd like to try a trial of intermittent fasting in patients with asthma. So in that, that study, took, uh, there were 11 subjects, so it's a small study, 11 subjects, and then he he took blood and measured their asthma symptoms, their airflow with a respirometer, um, and then he started them on every other day severe energy restriction. So every other day they ate only 400 calories. Okay, so that's very, I wouldn't know, was it four? It mix it. I can't, it's somewhere between four and six, I can't remember. Anyway, very low calorie diet every other day. And then at two weeks a month, no, what is it? Yeah, two weeks a month and two months, he did all this again, you know, measure the asthma symptoms, do the airflow, take the blood, then he sent the blood, all the samples to us. So the subjects, not within the first two weeks, actually, um, they started to lose some weight already then, but we measured the TNF in the blood. And in the group, it started to go down between two weeks and a month, and then it went down further by two months, a lot. And we also made an, another pro-inflammatory cytokine called interleukin-1-beta. And then he found that their asthma symptoms were lessened and their airflow in their lungs was increased uh, in that. <clears throat> now, in that study, we didn't have a control group to, that was matched for calorie intake, so we couldn't say, is this just due to reduce calories or is there something else? But both calorie restriction and intermittent fasting will reduce inflammation. And then finally, another way they reduce inflammation is by, in the long term, preventing the formation of what are called senescent cells. And even um, there's some studies suggesting caloric restriction, intermittent fasting can eliminate senescent cells. So senescent cells are cells in uh, say your skin cells, uh, 
normally divide their fibroblasts and then <clears throat> as you age, some of those, and then usually they die and then they're kind of sloughed off. But um, as you age, some of these uh, dividing skin cells will stop dividing, they'll get physically really big and they'll start producing TNF. Mm. So these senescent cells are another source of inflammation that that we think intermittent fasting and and also caloric restriction can uh, counteract. That's so important to know because there's so many people that suffer from asthma and just like a lot of other conditions, they don't feel like there's very much they can do besides take medicine. You know, they don't know that there's other lifestyle habits and behaviors that they can adopt. Now in that study, I'm assuming that they didn't change what they were eating. They were just restricting calories, correct? Yeah, so in that study, so on the days that they ate ad libitum, they just did what they normally did. Mm -hmm. On the calorie restriction days, they ate shake. Okay. You know, so they all had the same Exactly shake the same calories, yeah. Yeah. Okay. And it was highly controlled. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, we've mentioned body weight a lot, but are there benefits to intermittent fasting beyond the weight loss? Yes. Uh, one one thing is cardiovascular risk factors. Um, so in rats, we did these studies where we implant transmitters so we can continuously monitor their heart rate and blood pressure 24-7 as they're in their cages. And so it the, the surgeon in my lab would implant the transmitter and then we divide the animals into two groups. One was on the other, every other day fasting, the other the control ad libitum diet, and then we'd let them go. Now, actually, we did a 30% daily calorie restriction group there too. So we had <laughs> three groups. And so what we found is by two weeks, we just started to see reduction in resting heart rate and blood pressure. It wasn't quite statistically significant. By three weeks in a month, it was statistically significant, and it kept going down through two months. So a decrease in resting heart rate and blood pressure. And then, and then what we did after the two months, we put put all the animal we put the animals back on ad libitum feeding, and within. Again, between two weeks and a month, their heart rate and blood pressure went back up again. Mm -hmm. So this is actually what's seen, and it, it's not as we, the effects I just said. They're not as dramatic as you get with aerobic exercise, but they're clear and statistically significant. So with aerobic exercise, you know, if you're exercising regularly, so for example, I used to run a lot, ride mountain bike. And then I had a mountain bike injury. I had to have three surgeries. I went months and months and months not being able to exercise. And, you know, as my resting heart rate went up. My blood pressure went up. And this is even though I'm on intermittent fasting, right? So people should recognize this. Intermittent fasting is not a substitute for exercise. My own experience is that actually from the standpoint of mental health and maybe even general health exercise is very important. Yeah. Um, but anyway, so the point there is that, and, and we think the mechanism is overlaps between exercise and intermittent fasting and how they affect heart rate and blood pressure it has to do with enhancement of what's called the parasympathetic nervous system. So that's one thing improved. And then, Cholesterol profiles are improved some insulin sensitivity. Um, and then there's a lot of work. If one was to go on the clinicaltrials.gov, which is the, the source for all ongoing and even you know many completed recent clinical trials of anything, and you, you type in intermittent fasting in quotes. So if you do that now, you'll get, I think the last time I checked, it was about 150 studies. Wow. If you would have done that, 
yeah, 10 years ago, you get maybe 10. And so actually all, the, all this kind of popularization of intermittent fasting, it's kind of interesting, Dr. Yami, that that kind of created a, a, a almost a public pressure on the scientific community and NIH to do more research on this mm -hmm. because yeah. patients would go to their doctors and ask them about it and their doctors, they, they may, you know, for a while they may not even not even heard about it or they certainly didn't know that there was science behind it and some clinical trials have been done. And so that's one reason we were invited to write a review article for the New England Journal of Medicine a few years ago you know, two reasons. One, physicians need to know about this. And number two, there's a lot of data. And then that, the NIH started funding, or actually uh, requesting proposals, grant proposals for clinical trials of intermittent fasting. And a lot of them, Dr. Yami, are in cancer. Um, cancer cells like glucose, they don't like ketones, all right? So if you're in the fasted state where your glucose levels are in the low normal range, your ketones are up, that's bad for the cancer cells. It's actually, we think, good for the your, your body cells, right? So there have been studies in animals showing that intermittent fasting can uh, reduce tumor growth, and it can enhance the ability of chemotherapeutic drugs and radiation to kill cancer cells. There are human studies, there's a few published now, actually Michelle Harvey did one, we helped a little with it. It was more just a feasibility to see if women with breast cancer could tolerate being on intermittent fasting while they're getting chemotherapy, and the answer is yes, they can. The study wasn't designed to see, is there a recurrence of the the cancer. But there are other studies with, um, well, they're starting to look at this. So there's a lot of rationale to think that, you know, if I, for example, if I had cancer and I was undergoing chemotherapy, this is my personal opinion based on my knowledge, I would <clears throat> fast <clears throat> while I'm getting the chemotherapy. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Dr. Walter Longo has done a lot of work in that area as well, yeah. showing that not only can it make the chemotherapy more effective, but actually reduce the side effects too. And I'll say that for me, like one of my worst nightmares is having immense nausea. So I would do it even just to decrease the side effects. You know, I feel like that would be a big bonus. And one of the reasons that Dr. Walter Longo created that fasting mimicking diet is because he felt that physicians would be hesitant to put their patients on like full water only fasting. But it looks like once people hear about it and practice it, they actually um, are able to adapt to it okay, especially if they have a legitimate reason to try it. So I think there's lots of uh, data coming out that's gonna be very interesting. And I actually have one guest that's going to be part of this series that she herself used fasting as part of her breast cancer chemotherapy oh, treatment regimen. Good. So we'll hear from her experience and, and how good. it went for her. Okay, I want to ask about the effects of intermittent fasting, it seems like what you're saying is they do get better over time. So it's not something that you might not see the effects like in the first week or two in the first few days, but the more you stick with it, that consistency pays off. Is that true? Yes. And then my other question is, is there benefits to mixing it up? I mean, you know, there's kind of like this every other day, alternate day fasting where you're having low and then high. If somebody, you know, you have the same regimen, I kind of like to stick to the same regimen. Is there a benefit of having days where you're going three meals and then going back to your regimen? Does that make any difference when it comes to how effective it is for your body? Um, we don't know the answer to that because those kinds of studies haven't been done. It gets, you know, the, the more groups you add on, then 
you know, because you're going to have to compare head to head, say, you know, someone who's switching around versus someone who's sticking to the same one versus someone not on intermittent fasting, all in the same study. Now that can be in animals, that's a little easier to do. Um, and, but it, even in animals, it hasn't been looked at. Yeah. Okay. What about what we eat? Does what we eat matter? And if someone had to choose one or the other, they want to either start with trying to improve the quality of their diet. Maybe they're eating standard American diet, ultra processed food versus they want to start to implement some fasting. Where would you choose for them to start? Well, I'm kind of on board with Mediterranean diet, blue zone diets. I'm not so keen on ketogenic diets long term. Um, and so, you know, I, I wrote a article with, from an evolutionary perspective. This is again interesting. So, if you look at, if you open your mouth and you look at your teeth, and you say, what do they look like? Do they look more like you know, a cow in the pasture or a horse in the barn, or do they look like your dog or a wolf or a lion? They look a little bit more like a herbivore. Yes. We're omnivores, right? But we're, our teeth are actually evolved to kind of grind things, which is, so predators, right? Meat eaters usually they like tear a piece of meat out and they don't even chew it much. They just kind of gulp it down. I don't know if you've, you must have seen dog do that. Right. So that's just kind of a simple look in the mirror evidence that we evolved at least partially herbivores, mainly even herbivores. And certainly our, our non-human primate, uh, you know, ancestors, that lived in the arboreal canopy, you know, in the, in the tropical forest, they're, per, they're vegetarian. Okay, so I wrote this article for Scientific American, it's called What Doesn't Kill You? And the whole point of the article is that the chemicals in fruits, the skin of fruits particularly, and in vegetables, you know, particularly like younger, less ripe vegetables. Um, they, the reason they're in the plants is they function of nat as natural pesticides to dissuade insects and herbivores from eating them or too much of them. And so all these chemicals that there's a lot of evidence are good for health. Sulforaphane, uh, turmeric, curcumin, um, actually even caffeine, if you put, them on, put it on your tongue, the pure chemical, you wouldn't want to eat it. It's very, they're very, very bitter tasting. Uh, we did this one study where um, there's a chemical in green, to, the skin of green tomatoes, it's called tomatidine. <laughs> okay, and it's kind of interesting because it's at high concentrations when the tomatoes are green, and then as they ripen and become red, it kind of largely disappears from the skin of the of the tomato. Okay, so the green tomatoes, the seeds in the tomato are immature. They wouldn't be able to germinate until the tomato's ripe. Once the tomato's ripe, actually the plants evolve this maybe so that animals will then eat the tomato, their seeds go through the gastrointestinal system and they poop them out, you know, somewhere else. And then, you know, the, the plants spread. But anyway, the point of this is we evolved many ways to deal with these potentially noxious chemicals. One is the bitter taste. You know, we can't eat too much because they're too bitter. The second is we vomit if we eat too much. The third is there's enzymes in our liver that rapidly remove them. Those enzymes, often man-made chemicals, 
There aren't enzymes in the liver that remove them because we didn't evolve with them. Then the, the fourth mechanism which we've studied is these chemicals in the fruits and vegetables, they impose a direct stress on cells. And the cells respond adaptively through these gene expression pathways. For example, the antioxidant enzyme pathways that are activated by sulforaphane. That's the same pathway activated by intermittent fasting and exercise. You know, so, yeah, so anyway, I, I think, you know, avoid simple sugars, um, eat very little red meat, um, fish, olive oil is good, um, nuts, I eat quite a few nuts. Um, uh, you know, you can get a lot of calories from nuts and they tend to be pretty healthy fats. Uh, yeah. So anyway, and eat stay lots hydrated. Of vegetables. Yeah. And eat lots of vegetables is what you're saying is those vegetables um, yeah. are creating some of that good challenge that we're getting from exercise and also yeah. from fasting. We're getting them from vegetables, a whole separate mechanism that we can help create those healthy habits that leave lead to well-being and longevity so i'm on, totally on board with the vegetable message so thank you for supporting the vegetable message okay so we're almost to the rapid fire section but before that i would love for you to tell us where we can connect with you and where we can find your book tell us about your youtube channel you're putting out some great content there okay so my books if people can easily find me, find me if they just put Mark Matson. Uh, you know, on Google, I'm. I think I'm should be the. So my Johns Hopkins um, web page will be one of the first ones to come up. So if they just put Mark Matson, Johns Hopkins, my, and they can con contact me by email. Like, uh, you know, I I generally communicate by email. I don't, I'm not on Twitter or any of these. You know, Facebook. I think I was uh, wise in avoiding that kind of uh, chatterboxes. And then, um, yeah, so my book came out a little less than a year ago, The Intermittent Fasting Revolution. It's on Amazon. And then the second book will come out in August. That can be, you know, it'll be everywhere, Amazon, Barnes & Noble. And then uh, my podcast, so my podcast uh, is mainly oriented to people with a, a strong interest in science and a little bit of background in it, at least uh, probably even some college biology or something like that. It's called Brain Ponderings. And it's, it's on Spotify. I have a YouTube channel, Brain Ponderings. And it's me chatting with world leading experts in various aspects of neuroscience and neurology. You know, basic neuroscience, how does learning and memory work, et cetera, et cetera. Addiction, all that stuff, basic science, and then clinical stuff, different diseases. And so it's, it's just a chance to see all in one place. I can't find any other place. You know, I'm doing this a lot for, like, say, college undergraduate community, uh, interested in science and particularly the brain, because there's actually no one place to go where you can have all these conversations of all the leading experts throughout the whole field of neuroscience and neurology. Amazing. Yes. Thanks for doing that. Super interesting. Lots of great topics on there. And yeah, the power of the internet to help bring us all of those amazing topics. Okay. You ready for the rapid fire section and we can close it out? Yeah. Is this going to be yes or no answers? Just short sentences. Okay. Here we go. What's your favorite thing about fasting? Uh, it improves my cognition and productivity. What's your biggest What's your fasting pet peeve? pet peeve? Um, I don't have one. What about like something like a myth or a misconception, a misuse of fasting that is present right now in the world? 
Um, a myth. Yeah, I'm not sure. Not sure. Okay. Not sure. okay. Last thing. Yeah. Last thing. What's one thing what you want people to, want understand people to understand about fasting? About fasting. That uh, that most people can switch their eating pattern to an intermittent fasting eating pattern and stick with it, but they have to persist for up to a month. Got to hang in there. Yeah. Dr. Mark Maxson, thank you so much for joining me on Veggie Doctor Radio. I appreciate all your work. I'm so grateful for what you do and so grateful for your time. And I think that, I hope that you have a very plantastic day. Okay. Thank you. It was nice talking with you. Goodbye. Hey, veggie lover. I hope that you loved today's episode. Will you take a second and do me a huge favor? Please subscribe to my podcast so that you never miss an episode. You're the reason I'm here and I want to share it all with you. Thank you for listening and have a plantastic day.